the future of photography. Hello, welcome to the future of photography. Um, it's it's just an audio episode today, um, but with me as usual, Amar, Jeremiah, and Adrian. Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 <sighs> yeah, it is. Uh, it's a bit of a network challenge here on my side. So uh, people are digging up the road as we speak. So it should be back to normal. <laughs> so everyone who's watching this on video. Um, the picture's not moving, that's on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of video, just a quick little bit of housekeeping before we get started. And uh, that is our show has its own home now on YouTube. We have our own YouTube channel, which, which is kind of... It, it's kind of weird to introduce that with a video that doesn't move, but <laughs> <laughs> if any one of you listening to this uh, didn't subscribe to the YouTube thing because it was kind of intermixed with my other podcast because I had it all on my private channel, that's in the past now. We are on our own channel. You can subscribe. Actually, you should subscribe on YouTube. The link is in the description. And uh, and click the bell and do whatever the other YouTubers tell you that, that, that is true for <laughs> us too, because we are pretty much starting this channel from scratch, from zero. So um, we are going to watch the subscriber number hopefully go up a bit. Um, yeah, but having that said, let's dive into today's episode, which is titled 10 Years From Now Editing. This is our 10 Years From Now series, and this time... Um, we want to talk about editing and how that might look in 10 years. So it's a bit of a speculation episode, I guess. Well, personally, I'm going to speculate wildly and without constraint. Yes, me, me also. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, fantasies. you know, my, my speculation is I'll just put it out on the table and then everyone else gets a go. But my speculation is in 10 years, what editing? Ooh. <laughs> That's, right. that, that, that's either really deep and zen-like or there's, or there's more to come. <laughs> that's, that's the lazy way, but I have a suspicion that the, it, the whole process of editing is not going to be a, a thing in the future. Well, un unless you want it to be. Unless you want it to <laughs> Surely. be. Surely. Right. That's an interesting... I think, okay. our, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure that that would be possible unless someone had a very consistent aesthetic of what they really liked in a picture and was able to go take my pictures in my personal style and uh, correct for that and oh, you just, every shot you just show the machine your photography and yeah. then the machine goes ah i know what uh, Chris, Chris's <laughs> photography looks like. You like um, no, my yeah, machine yeah. would never. Yeah, be your able machine would be completely guess. confused. <laughs> we would be, you so know, that mine. spinning ball, whatever that spinning ball would be, uh, would con you know continue to spin, and and that that's why I think uh, the future of editing is probably. I think you know we've touched on this is going to be voice command AI and an intuitive yeah, are understanding. Are you sure about that? Yeah, the, I'm the, not sure. I'm I'm looking mm. at the at the original Blade Runner scene, the enhance scene where he goes uh, left, right, go to three point four, <laughs> zoom in, enhance that kind of stuff, yeah. and that sounds that just never really made sense to me because I found this really awkward. It took such a long time to just to just zoom into some place and look at it. See, um, I would think I would think that you take a picture and you'd go, get rid of that person on the beach, clean this up, make make the skin glow. Uh, because uh, I think we have reactions to photographs and those reactions instinctively are going to provoke some kind of pleasure, pain adjustment and there must be a way of communicating that to our devices whatever they are whatever capture devices we may be using in 10 years but i think applying uh the visual field turn day into night to make this moody uh too flat wh whatever our reactions instinctively are when we look at an image we can bust out of that and and i think we could discuss the difference between manipulating photos for an intention of art, for commerce, for clarity, 
uh, or for just plain um, recording. Uh, all of those would have a slightly different uh, aesthetic. Hmm. I, I feel I, like the physical act of um, kind of using your hands to do, I can't imagine um, using voice control to edit anything, even if I could, because I think I enjoy the physical doing of it too much. Do you know what I mean? I, I can well, get, I, I can yeah, get with that. And also sure, the, there's, there's a precision, isn't there? Uh, there's a craft involved in it. Yeah, yeah. I much prefer the idea of actually, you know, like a VR helmet, like standing inside um, an environment and like with your body, with your hands, being able to like paint the walls or, you know, make <laughs> your adjustments cool. <laughs> inside the picture. That'd be really cool. So would you do like a painting motion? You go, oh, I really don't like the color of this wall. I'm going to paint, I'm going to paint, go in my 3D environment <laughs> no, and I'm going to paint people, the wall. People are lazy. They're not going to want to do a workout when, when editing a photo that would that's... probably be the only way you'd get me to do work <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I, I you know I, I you know i enjoy the kind of pen on a tablet uh you know just in the same way that a painter likes the tactile free uh free feeling of of, of brushes paint and resistance and, and mm. friction on a canvas I, I i that's a different kind of of uh process but i think i can look at an image that i've taken and and i go like i really want to create a lookup table a lot um and apply um a very very quick uh instant uh change to the capture and then i can kind of fine tune it if i want to so that um, sounds like you need a new version of davinci resolve or something there jeremiah okay. you slap a yeah, slap a rec 709 lut on it and then do some edits prior to that in the workflow with a different node and you're done that, <laughs> that, that's it that, that's not 10 years from now though that's well, no, that's, now. that's already that there now. that's right now <laughs> right but, um yeah I, I, i'm looking for for something that really um may be a programmable um intention which is a word i like to use a programmable intention of what i expect out of a capture and then the device i'm not even going to call it a camera yet um will automatically understand what that is and will learn um what's good and what's bad in terms of what i want uh, and maybe that would make every picture i take fantastic yeah, I that's an interesting... In terms of workflow, especially if you're going through tons and tons of images or trying to get through a series that you're making the same changes to over and over again, be very mm, useful. Chris, you'll have to do a new version of your ebook on editing large collections of photos quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so let, me, let me bring up another thing to talk about, and that is AI and its inherent biases. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure how often you've come across this, but mm -hmm. um, there was this, I, I just, just a couple of days ago, I ran across a tweet of someone who said in, in Finnish, in the Finnish language, we don't have gendered pronouns. And then they just plugged a few, um, a few terms into, a few Finnish terms into Google Translate and translated into English. And it was text. Book wow, gender yeah. bias. Um, he invests. She washes the laundry. He's playing sports. She takes wow. care of the children. That's he works. Mad. She dances. He drives a car. And of mm. course, these 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 engines uh, that 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 power these things are are trained on everyday texts. So that's. I mean, it's kind of clear where they have their bias from. But so. Okay, so can we talk about that? Because right? I, 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 I sort of live a little bit in this world in my professional life. Okay. What you're talking about there is AI that's been trained by somebody else. AI that's that's been trained so, with a data set of some sort. So that sort, is yes. very, very much a a, a vendor based approach to things, right? So you know, or, or, and and all of our devices and all of our software has has some level of of that. I mean, even 10, 15 years ago, you'd buy a, a high enough level DSLR and it would come with it. It would have been baked in with a uh, a, a set of 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 images that would inform the automatic metering of a scene. 
So not the AI that we know today, but but mm. sufficient training based upon a database of, of images that it could it could get the metering right. You know, things like overexposing for snow because of the tendency to expose the white as 18 percent gray, you know, that sort of thing. But th- this is all vendor oriented model training. So what if and, and, and take take a, a data science approach to this and what data scientists do day to day? What if they, you you had your own? trained model that's the thing um that i want to get to now if i had my own trained model based on trained on the things i like the art that i like um i'm afraid that might just stifle my development oh good right? good point good oh point. i can absolutely guarantee that would happen yeah. that that's that's happening in our information age where especially here in america we are in our information bubbles. So our truth mm-hmm. is not shared. And the more we kind of recycle our own, as, you know, aesthetic, uh, you know, loves, uh, the less expanded our universe is. There's less time for surprise and influences that are new. It's a really good um, point. Yeah. Uh, it's a really good I, point. I, just, just the other day, in fact, I noticed that I'd taken a photo of myself staring wistfully into the sunset wearing just a bikini top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's one for the ages too uh-huh. uh, you know has anybody here um read uh ray kurzweil's first book the age of spiritual machines and uh, i haven't uh, no i haven't i know of uh, it and i know of yeah. Ray Kurzweil, but yeah you know so so you know when he he posits i'm gonna paraphrase right, I, but, I did play he, a couple of his synthesizers though yeah me too in fact i think i own one but i'm not sure where it is <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. (laughs) You know, what he posits is when processing power becomes as fast as the synapse functions of the human brain and and we have uh, storage capacity that is unlimited and connectivity, which is universal and translation, which allows all information at every time, every book read, all kind of in a kind of grand machine that that machine will achieve consciousness. And if we have uh, devices that have achieved a kind of consciousness, we can maybe send it out into the world to take our pictures, both randomly and with a specific aesthetic intent and and basically, uh, uh, you know, come back uh, with the kinds of, of images that, would appeal to us um <laughs> but then but then so, it's, it's not your image anymore is well it? is it our image when we use a completely automatic uh camera that is pre-programmed <laughs> to you know mm-hmm. uh enhance or or um process yeah. uh, re- reflected so light i would i would think light. i would think if you go back to the to what this episode is about 10 years in the future <laughs> i don't think we have conscious <laughs> machines that can do this in 10 years <laughs> hopefully not <Yeah. laughs> well. so so well i'll tell you, I'll, I'll have a go then because i was i've had some fun thinking this through as well mm-hmm. so and uh <clears throat> i think there's a couple of things that that relate to editing and so far we've talked about you know some some uh, changing to f- photographic images in software but that we haven't talked particularly about um you know a, a more physical interface and how that might change beyond the dictation stuff so I, I i've got this sort of you know uh, minority report thing going on in my head right where i have uh, i know a, a holographic projection of some sort floating in the sky in front of me mm. or, or something like that and i'm able to take things and move them just like uh, tom cruise does a minority report when he has that big sort of transparent computer interface in front of him mm. and even better if it's 3d right so if we're taking 3d images i want you know i think ema's idea was better actually about going inside it and painting the walls and stuff like that that <laughs> sounds brilliant but um, I, I'd like to be able to move, you know, okay, oh, well, you know what, I, n- I need to make a compositional change. So I've got my 3D image and I don't like quite where that vase is on the table. I'm going to move it to the table and the other side of the image. So I'm going to go into my 3D image my, you know, you, you, and, and pick it up and, and put it over there. And stuff. Mm-hmm. I'd like to be able to do that and play with composition. That's a different type of editing, I know, but uh, rather than simple and replace the, the replace the sky. That, kind sounds, of stuff, but. that sounds easy enough. 
um, yeah. because there are already I, algorithms the out there that can do these kind of things now. Yeah. So yeah, but um, not on not on photographs that you take though. So you oh, can yes, do it. Yes. You, oh yes. Can you yeah. really? Yeah. Wow. It's getting you, it's, can, it's, it's 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 there in some uh, in some. Uh, circumstances and it's getting there like automatic background replacements you have a 2d photo and you take an object and just move it and it fills in the background with whatever was oh, yeah, there but, or should have been there yes I, or, I, or what if oh i left a cup of coffee on the table nuts i'm going to just go in and take the coffee off the table oh, yeah. and then it replaces the surface of the table <laughs> without brush. Coffee i mean that's mm-hmm. already there can we mm-hmm. can we also apply um our definitions of editing to the selection of of images from a mass library or um a you know a fluid capture of hours and hours of of something that happened in other words imagine a magnum photographer or a magnum image maker um who will capture you know 10 minutes of a situation that is uh, inherently dramatic and then uh, have a program the AI or tell the AI it wants to find the most dramatic human moment within it and the AI will go and select from, you know, say 1,200 images that may have been captured, you know, in a 360 um, camera left in a place. Um, mm-hmm. pull out certain moments and then have that kind of uh, distilled down. So there, there's editing, you know, in the traditional way of just going through multiple images to arrive at something that is a synthesized um, image of the experience that one had tried to capture. That's, that's interesting. So that you've got automatic really hero okay. shot identification sort of yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. That's, it would save a lot of time. It would do, especially in in things like because because yeah, there are different types of photography and different reasons for capturing images, aren't there as well? So in, in photojournalism, that might be interesting, although a bit risky and maybe unethical. But or in, in like documentary, it could be interesting. Or something yeah. you know where you're they're waiting for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> so we're saying the next the next generation or ten years from now, a street photography oriented camera will basically be strapped to your head like you're a Google Street View car or something. <laughs> Oh, oh we, we in 10 years, we'll definitely have things strapped to our heads. And uh, I guess part of that is inward facing and God. part of that is outward facing. And yeah, mm-hmm. sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to roll with that just for a minute and butt in again, because one of my things, so, so editing for me isn't just about getting images, you know, to, to look nice on a screen. There's, you know, we've talked about presentation in the past, but, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I'd like to be able to in... I think, uh, I don't think VR, I think AR, I think augmented reality. I'd like to be able to do soft proofing of images in situ in an a- in AR. Um, and say, so say I'm working, I've taken a photo and I think, do you know what? I would like to print this photo three feet by three feet, right? And put it in a, a frame and hang it on the wall in my house. I would like to be able to go and look at that and say, okay, so I would I would have whatever the photo is that I've done. Mm-hmm. I've done my edit. I've run my soft proofing so that it, yeah, that it's it's toned it's toned it down to, to whatever the, the output medium is capable of. And I put on my I don't know, my special spectacles, my Apple glasses mm-hmm. or, or, or Google glasses or whoever makes them in those days, Samsung glasses. And I go and look at the space and I think, okay, yeah, it's projected there. It's soft proof. It's reflecting the way that lights would work on it. It changes. I could I could draw the curtains and get rid of the daylight. I could put the, the ceiling lights on or I could simulate the light and just understand how exactly my image would look under different lighting circumstances on the wall in my house. I think that's a big part of, you know, we, we don't talk often about printing but it, it is increasingly for me especially this year is is um is, is a bigger part of my photography mm. well yeah uh, i i i think the the editing for printing is a an, it's an another um another discussion because i'm currently in a um i made a print this morning that just the the black inks just were overbearing and not related to the image that I had tried um, to push out. And um, it, it would be really, really interested, 
interesting uh, for me to have a printer that had a voice activation that I would be able to ascribe certain tonal adjustments instantly through the printer and have it run another nice. sheet. Nice. Yeah, mm. that would be great. I don't think we're far from that. But so, but, so do do you use soft proofing for stuff like that, Jeremiah, or is, or do, are I you do. more of a, a suck it and see kind of a guy? No, no, I use soft proofing and yeah. it's all manner of of. Um, I, I generally use these piezography uh, rips that allow me to adjust very, very um, minute shifts in gray. I don't print in color, but I I do print in black and white. Okay. I mean, sometimes I print in color, but I print like everybody else. I just. <laughs> plug it in hope for the best and <laughs> make my adjustments elsewhere but black and white i'm uh i'm all over the different zones so i can do that in software and there is a translation that one has to get used to that so, would so i know that like. and uh, actually there's a question for you in here as well jeremiah because i know that actually um printing for a, a gallery show is is both a technical and artistic endeavor and and quite detailed because of course you've got to you've got to make sure the prints look their best in that gallery condition you can't print them you know at home in your living room mm -hmm. uh, and then expect them to look the same when you take them to the gallery so would you would you be interested in a, a an ar based soft proofing for a particular gallery show so that you could un you could understand the parameters of your printing requirements no um, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't uh, you know, I, I make the images that look good in my studio, and um, in previous shows, I've adjusted the light to uh, to match uh, okay. or enhance what I have mm. in the gallery itself. Okay. Um, so that's the other way around, then. Yeah, I don't want to, you know, that's that's like designing clothes that look good on a, you know, rail-thin model, but, you know, they'll sell, you know, mm -hmm. a couple of hundred of them, but, but not for the general population. Now... You know, that could be good in very limited ways. But um, for me, just, you know, galleries are, are effectively a storefront. And, um, you know, especially uh, nowadays, um, galleries are, are <laughs> they're under, under, you know, Intense siege pressure. from COVID and all that kind of thing and museums, mm -hmm. et cetera. Also, they are a, a bottleneck of the gatekeepers, both for positive and negative. And so, um, making the bottleneck the the kind of appropriate aesthetic determinative w would not be something that interests me. Mm. Okay, that, that, so there's an interesting insight for me. I mean, I I had thought that maybe there would be a, a use case for that there, but but not in the way that you prefer to work. Clearly. It's interesting. Okay, well, I'll no. have an, I'll have another go, right? So, um, <laughs> hands try up. something else. <laughs> I'll try something else. H hands up, who gets a little bit frustrated at not being able to unpick the computational processing paths in in the images that we make. Um, I guess this is one particularly that impacts those of us that shoot with phones, where a lot of the computational processing is baked in. Um, oh, so, do you like, want to get rid of the computational aspects there? Or no, you want to be able like to get to rid of it? Well, I, I, so off, often not the case. I mean, yeah, yeah. I guess you know, I, I shoot with an iPhone, um, and uh, I can choose different camera apps that that produce different types of output. But I don't wouldn't call that control necessarily. What might be nice is to have all of that computational processing path effectively as the way we would treat adjustment layers in Photoshop today. Yeah, but say, oh, do you know what? I want to take out the sharpening one, or I want to edit. I want to. Yeah. I want to tweak the sharpening one. But I'm happy what you've done with the lighting. Um, yeah. You know, you, you've raised the blacks a bit too high. I want to. I want to crush the blacks a bit more and have all of that capability. That's already there. Yeah. Is it though? Is Apple's it? Apple's sure. Pro Raw. That's exactly what Apple's. Uh, is it called Pro Raw? It I is think. called Pro Raw, Pro but you can't unpick it though. There are some things you can't you can't do. So if you shoot, um, it, you can't get to sharpening. Oh, okay. can't, um you can't you can get to you can do things like exposure and it and it'll it'll make clever adjustments based on some of the parameters i think but you can't you can't say oh i don't want that one or or you know there's no and there's no there's no addressable interface so you you oh. get a set of um you you, you uh, and i'll just talk about the 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 uh, ios photos app just for now um you get that you get your normal set of of sliders and things that you can work with but you don't get to choose 
how they're applied within that computational workflow. Um, you, you can't isolate elements of the computational workflow and uh, and take them out or boost them or anything like that. So I, I, I don't know. I just think it'd be nice to be able to see all of that, have it all unbundled, but maybe that's not the way the marketing departments want it to be. But are you saying you want that when you shoot or before you shoot? Um, um, I, I on, guess. On location no, rather than it, when you get home? No, I think I, 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 I don't. I don't want to spend more time setting up the camera to capture the image. Um, you know, apart mm. m- me personally, I'm more likely to trust that enough information is captured by that computational workflow that I can then go and adjust it afterwards. You know, isn't and, that just raw shooting <laughs> or negative <laughs> you know, shooting? You know, well, it's you know, not. The thing, is it the it's, thing this with is the thing I'm saying because they, they they do so so let's say they let's say it's a computational workflow that apl- that takes three images to blend them for adding dynamic range. Then mm. it adds some mm. sharpening, uh, and 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 actually those two examples would be fine. I mean, I find that with the with the uh, the Apple camera app. Um, it, the the sharpening is, is overdone for me. Yeah, I, I can remember when I got the the iPhone 11 first. It was the first thing I said. They're too sharp. Yes, I do. And, remember and I couldn't. Either, yes. Like, and it felt weird and wrong, and I couldn't. You change know, it. you know, two two things to that. Um, the first thing is, I think if you really could unbundle it, you'd be horrified how bad these things look without computational treatment. <laughs> um, Possibly. No, definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, and the second thing is, okay, a, a little story time here. A, a, a friend of mine is uh, used to be the, uh, used to lead a lab, one of the big photo labs in Germany. And uh, he um, told me about like the most busy day in in uh, in the lab where after the summer holidays two days after the summer holidays when people had brought their films to the drugstore and then the <laughs> delivery service brought them to the lab and then they had like i they processed like 20,000 rolls of film a day or something and wow. they had like an amazing throughput film development um the enlargement uh, cutting packaging getting them back to the right person and then they watched for the complaints right because there will people will be people who get the photos back they go to the drugstore they pick up their the bag of photos they open them up and say oh this one is horrible this one is too i don't know um this this one doesn't have enough contrast and this one most people don't even have those terms so <laughs> they were looking for the amount of complaints and they had two two dials that they could change to modulate the amount of complaints. And of course, it was always about getting as little complaints or as few complaints as possible. And mm. uh, those two dials that they that they could turn where or that that had an effect were saturation mm-hmm. and sharpness. Sure. So um, and and the complaints went down the moment they cranked up the saturation and the sharpness. <laughs> yep. Because the majority of people are not interested in what we are talking about here. They are interested in yeah. those pictures need to be crisp and good looking and I want to see my grandkids and so stuff. I'm, yeah, but yeah. That, that to me that just adds some credibility to my request here, right? Because, <laughs> you know, it, 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 yes, of course, everybody likes that. The, but there are those of us who might like a little bit more control. And I know, yeah, and and so so yes, you could have absolutely the default mode is that you 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 don't get access to that, and maybe you know the default mode extends to the fact that the 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 vendor provided apps. I'm not talking just about Apple here, but other vendors, the the vendor provided apps don't give you that access, but that they provide maybe an API that other people can develop third party apps that they can you know they can access these things. It, clearly, again, this is I, I, I failed twice in a row, haven't I? Well, has, has anybody else got any ideas of what t- editing might look like ten years from now? <laughs> well, it, first of all, you know, just to relate back to what you were talking about on an iPhone, I so agree with Chris. I mean, we're talking about lenses that are kind of minuscule. I think the entire image palette that we experience on an iPhone is all computational. <laughs> it's probably ten percent of it is kind of lenses etc it's all computational if you want to go beyond computational into kind of proper capture we are you know there's a a a litany of cameras available and things beyond cameras 
you know, sh surely we can go out into the world and do a, you know, future LIDAR, you know, just spin around and just capture the world, come back, and it all be in ultra, ultra, ultra HD, and then find our way into a framed kind of image. But that's, you know, that that's that goes beyond, I think, the scope of what we're talking about. Yeah, though, we're still talking about editing, to, right? <laughs> editing, right. Yeah, but we, but, we'll be but, but what we're editing in 10 years, Chris, though, isn't going to be the same as what we're editing now, is it? Because the capture phase will have moved on Very as well, true, so. very true. I think we, we also have to define what editing is, which we haven't. I mean, right now, you know, our tendency is to say, you know, we want it to have certain sharpness, color, contrast, uh, you know, whether it's tonal range, luminosity, all of mm -hmm. those things. That's how we relate to editing. But what I was saying before about editing the actual subject, uh, you know, uh, if you're a fashion photographer and you're, you know, you're working with, you know, a model or several and are shooting and shooting and shooting and you want to just combine that kind of look that the model will give coupled with the flow of the garment and the light that uh, all kind of works together to create a, you know, a, a, um, a feeling, you know, mm -hmm. the feeling of the brand, whatever you want to call it. Um, there may be a way of picking that out or you know from a programmable ai um so that when the kind of instinct of the photographer to create that mood and that generally would um you just plug it in and you know there's the five or six that do work and then you know you could do ending of the aesthetic afterwards but you know so there's there's the actual sifting through, and that's also editing. Um, so mm -hmm. editing does, you know, encompass a lot more than just a color sharpness, etc. cetera. Uh, but it also is about the subject and, and the light and the interaction of the moment, the decisive moment into what the image maker's intention is. So, you know, if we can define uh, editing for each of us, I, I think it would give us um, maybe even more confusion about what editing is in 10 years. Uh, <laughs> it's an interesting one. I guess the other thing that we haven't talked about of, of editing is, is um, you know, the sort of editing where uh, a, a photo editor at a magazine ed edits for presenting a, a spread that meets the brief for a particular article or, mm. or something like that, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, editing, I guess, I guess that that's, that's the editing or culling of, of a collection of completed mm. images as opposed to things that we'd like to do. I, I, we, and I think, I mean, possibly one of us described it a bit like that was to say, you know, where the, when uh, we were talking about a photographer who might capture 10 minutes of a situation and then say, pick out the, the most compelling images from that, please. Um, that, that... But by whose definition, most compelling by whose definition, the machines? Is it? Well, no, the photographers, because theoretically they could program the, uh, the intention into the machine. In okay. other words, they could yeah. teach the machine what yeah. it is they're looking for. That's that is it is yeah. so so let let's play with that a little bit because my mind for for no reason has jumped to a scenario where I say okay so I'm a photographer and um, I'm looking for drama right so I've trained my camera or, or my editing device or whatever it is mm. uh, to look for drama and I've done that by saying well it's the I want the images where most people's mouths are wide open in shock right <laughs> okay. and then I go shoot at a comedy club. <laughs> <laughs> right do i apply the same algorithm there is that the funniest moment then is it like uh, when everybody's mouths are open i don't know is it no is... because you're too broad you're too broad in your definition because you could have the you know are the pupils dilated are the eyes wide um are they looking away well, well then uh, oh back to but, but how would again. it take to teach the machine this uh, if i mean you i mean the no. machine ten thousand dramatic pictures and ten thousand <laughs> dull pictures well, uh, if, if you want to be this specific then, all of your own <laughs> if, if you want to be this you... specific we are we are in painting territory now uh, are we go on, go on chris what do you mean by that sorry well, because because as as Jeremiah just said, I mean, you you really you would really have to be very specific, and then you could just 
go ahead and make a drawing, a painting, and you'd have exactly what you want. Tea. Yes, but it wouldn't be true. <laughs> oh, let's talk about truth in photography. I don't think we'll, we'll figure this out in this episode. So I guess... Um, I guess is we'll there is there a future of editing that will look and feel different than it is now outside of the you know, um, ease of use? You How's know, it, it definitely will change. I don't think it will be like a sudden change, but we'll with like with everything, we'll slowly ease into it and not even notice that we are uh, experiencing a change. And, and so. maybe it needs a, a a a newcomer to the marketplace. Can't imagine. You know, so something like what Luminar uh, as a product, or as a company called Skylum, has achieved in the last couple of years, where they brought this whole thing about you know, one slider to fix the eyes, one slider to fix mm -hmm. the sky. You know, it may not be perfect, but but it took a new entrant into the marketplace to think of a new way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, I've been using. Uh, speaking of AI and and uh, you know control. I've been using a software called Topaz um, uh, AI Mask, so mm -hmm. the, the, or Mask AI, you know, which um, you have an image and you literally paint the areas that you want to keep and you paint the areas you want to either be transparent or blocked up, whatever you want. But in that transition between those areas, you paint yet with another color. That color indicates to the computer where it should focus its computational narrative. Ah. And once that's achieved, then you have sliders to bring that, you know, to make that fuzzier or sharper or cleaner or not. And you can then uh, brush and, and create very, very, very uh, good masks um, w using AI and your own kind of definitions of what you're looking for and then bring that into you know, Skylum or Luminar and uh, Photoshop and all, all, all of that. But it is pretty remarkable. And they also make a gigapixel, uh, which I did an experiment with just the other day where I used uh, my phone and to, take a, to create a very abstract image and then move it to a you know, three times bigger image uh, and protect the sharpness and texture. My God, it did an amazing job um, of taking, you know, a, I don't know, under a megabyte image and pushing it to, say, a 15 megabyte wow. image mm. with no noticeable artifacting. And I, so I think that on the intuitive editing uh, process, as we kind of move, we can see that in two and five year chunks how that's going to get better and better and better. So your computational images from a phone, uh, the uses of that could be much expanded by the use of, of sophisticated AI editing equipment. So I think we'll see that pattern where it won't be automatic, but it'll be enhancements to what it is we all love about our own images. That sounds very exciting. It is. <laughs> Ah, okay. <laughs> With that, let us proceed to the picks of the week. I don't think we have a we have a what what does that mean for the future of photography, right? Not really for this kind of an episode. <laughs> it's all speculation anyway. So, yeah. uh, let's see. Jeremiah, you brought us a link to a Petapixel article. Yes, it's an it's an article, and it's called AI artificial intelligence, and the battle for the future of photo editing. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> on brief, on brief. Just to be on point. And it discusses Luminar. It discusses Adobe Sensei, um, which is an AI-powered tool. Um, uh, some of NVIDIA's stuff. It, it interviews um, Aaron Nace, who's always very entertaining on Flurn. Um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, Pratik Nake of Solstice Retouch. You know, really, really interesting people who are really at the, pushing the boundaries of editing and, and all masters in their own way. You know, uh, Skylum is mentioned. And, you know, many of the things that we have been discussing are all there and with uh, um, neural discussions all of that and and so i i find it extremely exciting i think that that the 
overall feeling is that, you know, some people are afraid of it, some people embrace it, but it's coming regardless. So we might as well embrace it and learn to use it to our yeah, benefit. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Um, Imar, you brought us a good old friend. I brought you a good friend, Hipstomatic again, ex go back to it again, but <laughs> for Adrian, doubt. Adrian, exciting news. You can now um, import your images into Hipstomatic X like you can with the old one, oh, um, can you? which you couldn't oh, yeah. do all along. And I've just discovered. And uh, another thing that I'm loving that and then another thing that I'm loving about it is I've kind of discovered this other feature that's called the stack where it's like um, you post your images, but other people post their images it's really odd and you kind of swipe through them but um i'm seeing some lovely images on there I i'd say it's a pretty small group of people who are sort of um feeding into it at the moment but um really interesting um and i'm loving it and it's another way to um i found another way to kind of uh another place to put my picture of the day at times now i haven't used it every day but um I'm definitely um, getting drawn back to it. It's the feel of, of using that app now, I've, I've actually, I've shied away from the classic hipstomatic completely. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to <laughs> just try again with it, Adrian, if, um, if that was one of the things that you didn't like about it, I would say, yeah, go back and check it out. They've made some changes in there. Um, the, the, the stack thing is um, strange in that you swipe through everybody's images, your image goes up. But there's there's not that much interaction, so it's not like um, not like Instagram or Facebook or uh, and it, there is a kind of a liking system, but it, you're stamping on somebody's um, stamping on somebody's image, so oh, right. it, it has that. It's got a quirky look to it as well. Um, yeah, I, I I just recommend people go back and check it out again because they're definitely um, co obviously constantly working on it, making it better all the time. It's um, amazing that this has that this has been going so strong for so long. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that they they're reinventing themselves over and over yeah. again. And actually, I signed up now for the subscription. Um, oh, look at that! Kinda, yeah, and like I think it's twelve euro for the year, which is well, that's nothing. nothing yeah. Uh, um, and yeah, I'm really, I'm loving it. So yeah, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, Thank you. Maybe I'll go and have a look at it. I think I I think I've. Uh, deleted it off my phone for the moment or, or at least relegated it to somewhere at the back where i never see it <laughs> sacrilege sacrilege well uh, no not the, not the classic version although yeah. i have found with the, the my my newer phone the, the the 12 the iphone 12 pro max if that's all the words in the right order um is uh it's been a bit buggy and just sometimes the ui has has you know caused it to crash and stuff like oh. that so so I haven't had a great deal of joy with it. but um, Well, they updated it. Maybe that fixed a maybe, few things. Yeah, maybe, yeah, try again. always good, aren't they? All right. Yeah. The last two picks are both gadgets. I'll go first. Um, it's a new drone. Yay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm, that's a nice DJI thing. just uh, oh, released the just... FPV, the first-person view drone, which oh. if you've ever seen these, these, these drone flights that are very acrobatic, um, like crazy swirling around flying through the tiniest holes these kind of things that used to be the realm of um of people who were really techy really uh, into it and really like modifying existing drones taking panels mm -hmm. off so they were smaller and that kind of stuff um oh they are really coming to get you um <laughs> <laughs> coming to get you <laughs> I, I live right by the fire station oh there you go so do i so do i um do you? Yeah. So anyway, uh, DJI has uh, done it again. They came out and uh, with a new drone, which is a first-person view drone. So, so you can have a pair of goggles for it that you will That's incredible. look through. And then a new kind of remote control. And it does 4K 60 frames per second and has like a 10 kilometers of distance with a video, which... I think legally you can't even That's do nuts. this here. Um, By the way, Chris also... In that package, you can have multiple goggles, yes. so you can take someone along for the ride. Yes. Oh, wow. Now, if you've if you've been inside a VR and trying like a roller coaster thing in VR, there's two kinds of people: ones who will totally get a kick out of that, and the others who will throw up instantly. <laughs> um, <laughs> this can be something like that. So yeah. careful there. But um, they. 
it's probably gonna attract a lot of people because they are really impressed by the first person view thing and then they will find out that it still takes quite a bit of training and learning and um, so there's a good chance or that in, more, a, sometimes. in a year from mm, now, we'll probably see a lot of those used. But uh, anyway, I think it's commendable that they are doing this over and over again and innovating and innovating and innovating. So And, 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 and a snip at 1,250 quid. Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a bargain, absolutely. Plus, ex, <laughs> plus additional accessories. Anyway, that brings us to another You'd bargain. You'd be too afraid to fly it in case you crashed it, I would, anyway. Well, well, well it maybe has not. Some, some crash protection built in a little bit. So this is, this is one, and I saw, I saw this, and I thought, you know, this, is, this has got to be about you know, the, the, the future of editing. And it reminded me of, of some, some uh, Jeremiah, some stories you've told us about some of your early work, um, maybe back in, in Toronto. Um, uh, and this is, a, this is a Kickstarter for a, for a thing called the Litty Hollow 3D hologram printer. And it is a desktop okay. 3D hologram printer where you put in <laughs> Um, something that looks to me from the Kickstarter video a bit like a, a slice of four by five film, <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> uh, and and it it uses lasers to print on. Uh, it, it'll print about twenty three separate images onto a single piece of whatever the medium is, so that when you move the hologram, you get you can get a fairly smooth movement um, of it. And it's a it is a Kickstarter. It's already achieved. Um, with in a week, it's achieved three times its funding goal, and this isn't the first product that that these people have tried to bring out either. So, so maybe there's a fighting chance of it actually coming to market. Feels um, to me uh, like like it's a uh, a lot of uh, Sturm and Drang about a kind of very niche, quirky. Um, I don't know the kind of thing you you'd throw in uh, a couple of quarters in an amusement park and pull one of these out and are <laughs> oh, definitely yeah, destined for the rubbish heap in another. Well, you are the you are all our hologram expert. You've you've made them yourself, so I have. It's not appealing have, to you I, at all. Not at all. Not at all. I, you know, I I I think that the, these holograms don't real. I've seen them. They they don't offer anything. Re they're they're cute little nuggets now if this thing was you know you could pull it out of a box top out of a little cereal box and go oh this is so cute but mm. um i'm sure it's going to be you know a couple of thousand bucks at least and um i don't think it offers anything really the great early, just because the early production model one thousand bucks there we go yeah yeah I just it's about, it's think about uh, so yeah, just over a thousand dollars for that, which I understand for it is is a a material discount on the eventual list price, which uh, they always do on Kickstarter. Yeah, which they always do. Yeah, yeah. this feels like just because something can be done <laughs> doesn't mean it should be done. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I I think the use of something like this is probably best as a service model rather than owning. Ah, so you go and buy it. Do you so go that, to the hologram so, store and buy it? I remember yeah. those from the nineties and eighties. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, yes. Um, uh, in fact, actually, when I was a teenager, a friend of mine, his his dad had a, a company that produced the the little glass plate holograms you used to get back in those days in the eighties, early nineties. There you go. Um, and uh, so, so that's an interesting. So, so Jeremiah gives mm. it a, a bar humbug review. Fair enough. I do. <laughs> um, but maybe, yeah. If you could go to, uh, I don't know. Let's say, you, let's say you're at a theme park and and you have your photo taken on the roller coaster. Would you yeah, like a like hologram? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like a, you know, a card you know. shop. For a you know, or or upload a, a, yeah. yeah, upload a series of pictures, get it in the mail. You know, that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, having and maintaining this is not going to be simple. And it's not really that small, to be honest. Looking no. at the pictures. No, when they say tabletop, I mean, yeah, it needs well, to be. Well, depends on the table, table and how much yeah. space you want to have <laughs> left on the table. <laughs> you can. It looks about that's the size cool. of a sort of small, uh, uh, the sort of laser printer you'd get for a small business. Yeah, that yeah. sort of size. Mm. I mean, if you're talking about things, you know, like those kinds of things, when you have, you know, maker bots and, and those kinds of 3D, real 3D. Uh, manufacturing pieces that can print on real metal or etch real glass you know imagine being able to you know sculpt something in glass or marble or whatnot on your desktop now you're talking 
<sighs> you'll have we'll we'll all have printer rooms or production rooms in the future, like uh, uh where all the stuff that we buy and print out ourselves, the three D stuff and so on. So that is is a major <laughs> theme in uh, a book by William Gibson. There you go. Um, not his current novel, but one he published about five years ago, I think. So, so ma many people will know William Gibson as the author of Neuromancer, a, a book that is often often credited as being a major influence on the the thinking behind the Matrix series of movies. Um, although I often think that Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson is a, is a closer analogy Ab to what yeah. the Matrix ended yeah. up as. But the cyberspace is a term that he did coin. Anyway, before we go <laughs> further down those... So, hang on, just one, one second, just, just <laughs> yeah, to finish the yeah, thought. Yeah, the yeah, book yeah. is called The Peripheral, and it is a, a, a typical uh, Gibson dystopian cyber... Not cyber, but a dystopian sci-fi story, uh, but it's a very good book. I read it. I loved it. <laughs> okay, put it, put a, link it in the, in the show notes. <laughs> Okie dokie. But with that, finally, we have, we're 50 minutes into this episode. <laughs> with that, finally, we're coming to the end of this wonderful episode of The Future Photography. Again, um, uh, we would be delighted if you could go over to YouTube. Again, link is in the description and leave us a subscribe. And this is, this is, uh, this is us asking you to help us tickle the YouTube algorithm so that it notices us and it only notices us if you click subscribe and the bell and stuff so um, help us out doing that and with that um, we're of course on the web thefuturephotography.com we're on twitter at tfop now on insta and we'll be back next week until then everyone take care and bye 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 You've been listening to The Future of Photography, a production by Adrian Stock and Chris Marquardt. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Hold up. 